Well, it's great to see everyone, and I just want to say we're moving past now. We've been through the book of Ephesians, and last week we looked at Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7, which was indeed another letter. Paul wrote a letter, the letter to the Ephesians, and indeed there was another letter written that Christ dictated through the Apostle John to the church at Ephesus some 40 years after that first letter was written. And in that letter from Christ, we saw last week, there was many commendations to that body of believers, many good things he said about them, but there was one thing he had against them. And that one thing was paramount, actually. So more important than many positives is that one major negative for them to realize and move from, and that was Revelation 2, verse 4, that says, but I have this against you, Jesus said, you've left your first love. You left your first love. And we talked about that first love that they left was Jesus Christ and that he must have preeminence in that church's life and those individual believers' lives and he must have preeminence in our life as a Christian. He has to have the top spot, not just uh, in a list of things that you would put in your life. No, he has to have top spot in every category of your life. He must be the one from whom you have an incorruptible love for. And that incorruptible love was what Paul was telling the Ephesians he was praying for them to have. And they lost it. And so the question for us is, this morning, we move into this passage, Colossians 1, 15 through 19, and I want to see that we have a love that's incorruptible for the correct Savior, for the correct Jesus And so you have to ask yourselves as we go through the passage this morning is, do I love the correct Christ? Do I love the the accurate biblical Jesus? The world tells us that there are many equal options out there. And you just choose from one. But that is the scheme of the evil one. That is Satan bringing delusion upon this planet to say there are many saviors out there, there are many ways to get to heaven. And actually, some would say everyone in the end makes it. You and I just need to acknowledge and lean on a higher power, whatever the higher power of your choosing might be. All roads lead to heaven as long as you have a savior, small s. As long as you have a Savior, a God, small g. And whatever you have, as long as you believe with all your heart and you follow that, in the end, that will save you. And if there is one God, that one God will show mercy upon anyone as long as they believe what they believe with their whole heart. But the entirety of the book of Colossians, which we're not going to go through at this moment, but these few verses is going to point to the fact that the entire letter says it's the Christ that we follow that matters, and that Christ has to be above all. He's greater than all, and he's the one and only. In fact, in a biblical sense, we must understand who he is and get that right, or we're following a different Jesus, one of our own making. So if you don't follow, if you don't have an... uh, incorruptible love for the correct Christ in a biblical sense, then you fail to follow the right Christ, and if you don't follow the right Christ, then you're a disciple of that antichrist, a false savior. And then you're following a lie, and Satan's just saying, relax, just do it your way. God will still give you eternity with him. And you're following a lie, and that lie does nothing for you if you're following a different Jesus, one of your own making, and it places you actually waiting judgment, actually waiting eternal separation from a God. So I think it's important that we get this right. I'm telling you, you need to have a love. You need to have the first love. You need to have the best love for Jesus, but it has to be the correct Jesus. We need to get it right. Not a Jesus of our mind's own making. It's the sovereign Lord. It's the biblical Christ, the true high priest, the rightful king, the king of kings. Jesus is our Lord, and he is greater than everything, and he is greater than everyone of all time, forwards and backwards. Sometimes we as Christians think that there's 
there's Satan on one side and there's God on the other side. Like it's some type of spiritual Star Wars. There's the, the light side of the force and the dark side of the force and God puts a vote in for you and Satan puts a vote in for you and you're the deciding vote. But that's not what the scripture says. Christ is greater than everything and all and you and Satan and all put together. He is greater than that and God's not limited. Christ is not limited to your choice. He's not limited to my choice. God's not in an equal struggle with evil. God is not slightly sovereign. He is not a restricted ruler. He is not kind of a king. He is in complete control, sitting on his throne, supreme ruler of all, the universe. And the Bible tells us this over and over from Genesis at the beginning all the way to Revelation at the end and everywhere in between. There's an uncompromising truth that we must own and we must love that Savior, a God that is absolutely sovereign, infinitely elevated above his creation. He came into his creation, but he didn't stay there And sometimes that's where we keep him. So love of all must be the Lord of all, and we must be accountable to him. And he is accountable to no one. And he is challenged by no one. And he is influenced by none. And he is not going to change. And he is wholly other than his creation. And we like to think of him like passion of the Christ Jesus. Or we think of him like the chosen Jesus. But he is high and transcendent and high and lifted up, but he is nowhere near his creation at all. He's other than his creation. And he's exalted forever, amen? And the Old Testament tells us this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to go to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name for all generations. God told Moses, look, if they want to ask who it is, just say I am. What does that mean? It means he is. He is all. He is everything that matters. He is preeminent. He is I am. So if somebody asks, just tell them that. That will be puzzling enough for them. So when you think of Jesus, Jesus is God, which we're going to get to in a minute. You realize he is I am. Jesus is greater than all. He is preeminent. He's not one of many options. So let's look at the passage this morning that will answer the question that we've asked that the title of the sermon is, Do You Love the Correct Savior? Paul says in verse 15, he, referring to Christ, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. And look at the words here. For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created. How much? All. And in case you don't understand what all means, both in the heavens and on the earth, in case that's not good enough, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, in case you're missing, it's all things have been created through him and for him, that's Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. So this morning, I want to discover the true identity of Jesus as the Bible defines him. So you can ask yourself that question, do I love the correct Jesus? Because we all pull him down and humanize him in our minds at times. So Paul's writing this epistle to the church at Colossae to warn them against falling into the trap of the heresy that was going around trying to mess with God's identity, with Jesus' identity. And the false teaching was saying, look, Christ is not what you think he is that the apostles have been saying that he is. 
And if you attack Christ, that's a real threat. And it was a real threat to that church at Colossae. And it's a real threat for us here today because it's still happening. Anyone watch the opening of the Olympics? It's still happening. Attack who Christ is, and the very heartbeat of Christianity can be killed, and Satan is on the attack, and that's what he's wanting to do. Who Christ is, who Jesus is, has always been the very battleground of which all Christians must fight against the cults and all the isms that are out there. And Colossae had a war going on. And it wasn't just from one side. They had Greek believers, so-called, in the congregation. They had Jewish believers, so-called, in the congregation. And the, the, the Greek and the Jewish uh, believers that were saying they believed, they had a blended false teaching about Christ. And they were drawing from paganism, thank you, Greeks. They were drawing from Judaism, thank you, the Jews. And it sort, it sort of was a pre-Gnosticism, coupled with Judaistic legalism. And they married those two together. And what they were trying to say is, look, Greek philosophy says basically that a human body is evil and the spirit in a man matches God's spirit and that can be good. God is spirit, he's good, your spirit's good, your body bad. So what does that mean? I can do whatever I want with my body as long as my spirit is saved. How convenient. I can sin however I want with my body because body bad and spirit good. And it naturally came to conflict with the idea that, well, I still have sin to be paid with because I'm doing that in my body. There's the Judaism. There's the ceremonialism to, to fill in the gap. And this came naturally in conflict with Jesus Christ, who is the God-man. There's a serious problem now. The false teaching is saying, look, Jesus can't be God because God can't come into a body because body bad. And... If the flesh is evil, there's no way God can come into the flesh. So they pushed a Jesus that was a spirit-like Jesus, a ghost-like Jesus, an angel-like emanation of God, and it caused problems not just on that side. How about his death? Well, there's a problem of the crucifixion because if Jesus is not a man, how can he take on sin? And if he can't take on sin, how can he bear them on the cross? So Christianity falls apart because of this false teaching. If God is then not able to live a sinless life, he cannot go to the cross to, pay, to be a perfect sacrifice, so then we have a serious problem. You can't have your sins paid for. That Jesus wasn't really what the Bible says he was. And conveniently, our answer is ceremonialism. Just go back to what you used to do. Do the sacrifices. Do the washings. Do all those things, and that will fill in the gap. Jesus is not God. Jesus is not fully sufficient for you, and you must do things to make up the difference. And that's what they taught, and that was spreading through the church, and he's writing to the church, Paul is, with the inspiration of the Spirit, to warn them against this. So I would say this one passage that I'm bringing to you this morning He wants the disciples to understand to get the correct Jesus. And I want us to have the correct Jesus because that heresy didn't get stuck back in Colossae. It's in the church today. So-called Christian churches attack who Christ is. Colossians 1, 15 through 19 unfolds for us the true identity of Jesus, the biblical Jesus. And I believe for us, there's a lot of talk about Jesus today. There's a lot of talk about Jesus all over the place, on in your Facebook and all over social media. And it's you can go to the History Channel and there's going to be the real Jesus and meet his wife and meet all of his kids and meet the real Jesus. And then there's those churches out there that treat Jesus like he's a genie in a bottle. If you do this for him, he does this for you. Just make your three wishes and he will comply. So we need to ask ourselves, what Jesus do I love? With the incorruptible love. What Jesus do you love? Is it the biblical one or is it the one of your mind that starts with the biblical one but filters in some stuff that you think or that someone else thinks? that some false teacher thinks. And I'm spending more time to say this because realize if you worship and you love a Jesus that is not the Jesus in the scriptures, then your Jesus is an idol. 
There can be an idol named Jesus. Idol worship, to worship a Jesus of your own making is idol worship. And I don't like to name drop, but you know, so be it. I'm going to this morning. If you follow Bethel music, Bethel music comes from Bethel Church, and Bill Johnson of Bethel Church teaches that Jesus is not the Jesus you and I know. Jesus is just a man. And Jesus was a man when the Spirit came on him. He did all these miracles. Therefore, if you're a believer and you're a man and you have the Spirit, you can do all the same things Jesus did. So now you've attacked who Jesus is, therefore, when you sing the songs Bethel sings, when they say Jesus, it's not this Jesus. That's why we don't sing them. Because the teaching matters. The Jesus can be an idol if it's a Jesus of your own making. Not to mention there's a certain church in town, quite a few of them called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His name's in the title. It's Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, or they just go by LDS now. What about all these churches that use his name and use his name and say, I believe in Jesus too? Even Islam will say, I believe in Jesus too. Well, look at Matthew 7. Jesus addresses all these people in chapter 7, verse 21, and you guys know this maybe by heart. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because you're throwing the word around Jesus does not get you in. But it says, it's the one who does the will of the Father. Well, the will of the Father is for you to repent and turn from your sin and accept Christ and submit to him as Lord of your life, and then you will enter heaven. And he goes on to say, many will say to me, and I underline this in my own Bible, many. There are going to be many and many and many people that go before the throne and say to him on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Can you think of any churches that are prophesying? Do we not cast out demons? Do you see any of that happening on TBN? Maybe you do. And in your name perform many miracles we did in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So I'm trying to be serious enough to tell you, do you love the correct Jesus? Not just one that says it's Christian. Not just one that has Jesus in the title. Not just one that uses Jesus a lot in what they say. That sings about Jesus. And that sings words over and over and over so repetitive about Jesus and his love. And his love is more of a phileo love. His love is more of a familiar love. His love is more of a, a brotherly love. His love is more uh, one that has an emotion attached to it, not the true biblical love that the scripture declares. So do you have the correct Christ? What is Jesus' true identity that the word describes him as? Do you follow that Jesus? Do you love that Jesus with the incorruptible love? So let's turn to the passage this morning, and I don't think there's any better passage of Scripture that's more significant on the identity of Christ than this. It removes any and all doubt about Jesus' true identity, and then you can realize, as I started with, he is greater than all, and Christ is preeminent. Let's look at number one of your outlines, which is Jesus' identity in relation to the Creator. Verse 15 of Colossians 1, let's reread it. It says, He, being Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Translation Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He is the image of the invisible God. If God the Father is spirit, Jesus came in as a man, he's now a visible image of God, and this is not the same as the image spoke of as man made in his own image in the garden. No, this is not the marred by sin image. No, this is an exact representation of his nature. Hebrews 1, turn with me really quick there, a couple pages over. Hebrews chapter 1, it's this type of meaning of image in the passage at hand. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he, the Father, appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. See it there again? And he is the radiance of his glory and, look at it here, the exact representation of his nature. That is the image of the invisible God that's being spoke of in, first, in Colossians chapter 1. And it says, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
So we need to believe and we need to love this Jesus and understand that Jesus is the perfect image. He is the exact likeness of God. It's not oneness theology of T.D. Jakes. It's not uh, that he's a shapeshifter. He's God the Father and he shapeshifts into the Son and he shapeshifts into the Spirit. No, there are three in one God. There are three in one, Father, Son, Spirit, all one God, but Jesus Christ is as much God as Father is God. He's not just a man. He's not just a man waiting for the Spirit to energize him. You can't do what he did. He is God. It means that he's the manifestation of God on earth. Jesus is fully God in every way, in all ways, and Jesus is greater than all, and he is preeminent. And anything that any church does or any false religion does, to cheapen that must be shunned. John chapter 14, verse 7, Jesus says this, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. And Jesus said to him, (laughs) I can imagine him chuckling right now. Jesus says to him, look, Philip, 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 have I been with with you so long And yet you have not come to know me, Philip? I've been around you a long time and you don't know? He goes on to say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And I've spoken to JWs before, Joe's Witnesses, and they say, no, that meant like when I see you, you kind of look like your grandfather. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say you've seen something that resembles the Father. He said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. Making himself equal to the Father. And he says, so how can you say, show us the Father? I've been with you this whole time. Don't you see I'm him? Do you not believe that I am the Father and in the Father and the Father's in me? Don't you believe that, Philip? So even us as Christians, you may have been a believer a long time, went to church your whole life. We don't always think of Jesus as the creator. We think of movies like Passion of the Christ. We think of him being beat, and we're mad at those guards for beating him, and we want to jump in and save him. Or we think of the chosen, and then we see him on some app about prayer. Or we see him on talk, some talk show host talking about Catholicism. Or some Cecil B. DeMille great movie of the past. We think of him as just a man, and we're sorry for him, and we're angry because they're hurting him, but we don't think of him as God the Father, and we don't think of him as the creator equal to the Father, and yeah, the Father's creator, but Jesus is creator, the Father said so. And the Spirit created too, hovered over the waters. The entire Trinity, and Jesus Christ is God, therefore he is the creator, and that matters. It matters to who you believe that Jesus is. It matters to the one you love. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, For God, who said light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. If you were walking around when Jesus walked to earth, the glory of God was in Jesus' face because Jesus is God. So Jesus' identity in relation to the creator is he is the creator. He is him. Jesus is greater than all and he's preeminent. And so when false teachers attack that, the devil's trying to attack that. And if you're by association claiming that you're with him, then the world will hate you. And even Christians, so-called, will hate you if you say, I'm taking a stand because this is the Jesus of the Bible, and the LDS is wrong, and the JWs are wrong, and Bethel Church is wrong, and those on TBN a lot of times are wrong, the Health Wealth Gospel is wrong. You have to be able to say these are wrong because it's not biblical. And you can get a tattoo that says Jesus, but your heart can be far from Jesus. And God judges the heart. So I'm imploring us, as a body of believers, to have an incorruptible love for Christ, but to be the correct one. 
John 10, 30, Jesus goes on and says, I and the Father are one. One plus one equals one. Remember the new math? The Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus. Why? Because he said, I and the Father are one. That's why they were going to stone him. And then he said, I showed you many good works for the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? I did miracles. Why are you going to kill me for the miracles, Jesus said. Verse 33 says, the Jews said, for a good work, we're not going to stone you. We're going to stone you for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself to be God. The Jews understood what Jesus was saying, even though Bethel Church runs from it. And they were going to kill him for it, and they hated him for it, and it made them so mad, but it doesn't change the fact that it's true. Jesus Christ is God, and then it goes on to say in verse 15 that he also is the firstborn of all creation. That's not chronological. Any person knows that Jesus is not the first human being to be born. If it's not chronological, then what is it? It's position. It's position, it is rank. It's used here to show Jesus Christ is preeminent in rank. He is preeminent in position. Jesus, being the creator God, the son of the father God, holds the highest position above all. That his father has placed him at. He is the uncreated one. He is not just a man. He existed before creation. He makes uh, some appearances in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is greater than all, and he's preeminent. And we have to believe that with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. He is God with the Father and the Spirit, and he's creator with the God, the Father, and the Spirit, and he is exalted above everything, all rank, every person, every one for all time. Hebrews 7.26 says, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, Jesus, a holy one, Jesus, an innocent, undefiled one, that's Jesus, separated from sinners, that's Jesus, exalted above the heavens, that's him. Jesus is God, and he needs to be God of your life. He needs to be God in every category of your life. And we must submit to his authority. We must submit to him as God, to his will, to his mercy, to his love, to his grace, because that is what we need. So you might say, well, I don't believe in that God. I have gods in my life, but if Jesus isn't your God, if he's not the Savior God to you, you're not saved So, the relation to creator, which is God, is Jesus is the creator. And he's high above all creation, which takes us to number two in your outlines is Jesus' identity in relation to the creation. Colossians 1 again, verse 16 and 17. Paul goes on to say, for by him, referring to Jesus, all things were created, just in case you missed it, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. So Jesus is not only the creator, he's also the sustainer. Right off, he, he reestablishes, Jesus is God, therefore he is the creator. By him all things were created, it says. And all those false teachers are saying that he's not God. And he's telling them and those at Colossae, be careful. They're saying he's not God. He can't be God. He is God. And it's a front to God's very being to say he's not God. And we can think of cults today that espouse Jesus' name, and I mentioned a few, and they deny that Jesus is God, making them an abomination, even Judaism still today. And as God, Jesus' identity with relation to creation, as he's superior to it, he has a position above it, he has power over it, he has knowledge for, that's over it and wisdom over it because he's a creator. So he goes on both sides of the coin, the visible creation. What is that? Everything that's visible, the solar system, the universe. Have you ever done any Googling and just looked at the sheer gigantic size of the universe? It's staggering. Jesus is creator of all that. He's preeminent of all that. The sun, for example, think of this, is 100 times the size of earth. It has a diameter of 80, 864,000 miles. And if the sun were a hollow ball, it could fit 1 million earth-sized planets inside it. 
And there's a planet called Betelgeuse that has a diameter of 100 million miles. And if Betelgeuse were hollowed out, it could fit two quadrillion Earth-sized planets inside of it. And that's not the biggest one. So the magnitude of creation is staggering. The visible creation is staggering. They still can't find the end of the universe. They keep saying we found it and we know it. They don't know it. Understand Jesus is greater than all that and preeminent. And if you feel small talking about that, just another example is, do you realize that the stars in the universe are, are 10 times the 25th power that they've tried to figure out with computers to count, with supercomputers to count, which is roughly the same amount of grains of sand in all the beaches in the entire world, every piece of sand that comes home with you from the beach, every one of those grains of sand in all the beaches, that's how many stars are out there. It's mind-boggling. Turn with me to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words their voice not heard, their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. The creation cries out. And people aren't listening. That's why Romans 1 says, even if you don't hear the word Jesus, you're culpable, you're still guilty because you should look around at this visible world. You should look around at the expanse of all the skies and the heavens and say, something had to create this, and I want to know him. And if you want to know him, he'll make himself known to you. But they don't want to know him. They want a God with a small g, and sometimes it's themselves. So universe bears witness to his wisdom, his power, his sovereignty as creator, and then the invisible creation, the earth's axis going around the sun, and how the, the earth is tilted and spinning around, and then there's gravity, and then there's centrifugal force, and the fact that if we got a few feet closer to the sun, we would all burn up. Kind of been feeling like that lately. And if you're a few feet further out orbiting the sun, we would freeze to death, but it's at the perfect spot, coincidentally. There is no atom, there is no cell, there is no living thing, there's no law of nature that is random. It's all in accord to his hand. Verse 17 says, in him all things hold together. The Lord Jesus Christ is God, and as creator, he is also the sustainer, and all the physical laws which he governs are the forces of nature that we say mother nature. There is no mother nature. It's his nature. All the invisible forces and actions and operations, his sustaining will is doing that. His hand is doing that. His power is doing that. Jesus Christ is greater than all, and he's preeminent. He is gravity, or we don't have gravity. He is the binding forces that holds an atom together. Scientists can't figure out why an atom does not fly apart, because its whole purpose inside there is to explode. And when they tested the first H-bomb in World War II, they did not know when they tested it if it would ever stop. It might annihilate the universe. It never stopped splitting atoms once the first one broke loose because there's that much power in a little atom that God is holding together. Jesus is greater than all, and he's preeminent. And even in Luke 8, you can turn with me if you want, or you can just listen. In Luke 8, Jesus is talking about the weather in a sense, with his apostles, Luke 8, 22, now on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, let's go over to the other side of the lake, and they launched out, and as they were sailing along, Jesus fell asleep, you know that, he's in the front of the boat, fast asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped, water's coming into the boat, they don't have village pumps back then, and they start to be in danger, we're going to drown they don't have life vests. They came to Jesus and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. We're dying, Jesus. And he came up and got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped. Immediately everything became calm. And then he said to them, where is your faith? 
They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water? And they obey him. Guess what? The answer is, he's God. You shouldn't be fearful of the weather outside the boat. You should be fearful for the God that's in the boat with you. He rules, he rules over his creation. He's in control over everything in your life. Invisible and visible, the thrones and dominions and rulers it talks about. That's all the human thrones of the world in all time, all those human kings and rulers and presidents. And he's also referring to dominions and rulers and authorities as various angels and demons and all the above. Jesus is God, and Jesus is the creator God, and he created those angels, even the ones that fell with Lucifer. He created Lucifer himself. 1 Peter 3, 22, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and power that are in submission to him. They're all in submission to him. Even those demons, when Jesus showed up, they said, what do you want with us, son of God? Send us over into those pigs. We need to be away from you. The reality is, it goes on to say, if Jesus is God over the invisible world and Jesus is a controller of the visible universe, then all the things he created were through him and they're for him. And that includes you. And that includes me. We are made for him. If you're a disciple of his, that's for him, his pleasure, his glory. That is the hope we cling to as Christians. As a believer, that's the hope I cling to. He's my savior. He's my creator God. And if you're not a believer and you're not a disciple of Jesus, to think of the one that you're opposing. And you say, I'm not against Jesus. I'm just not for him. Well, Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So if you're not a believer, you're not a disciple of Christ, Look at who you're opposing, the very God that created you. Look at who you're rebelling against, the very God who created you, and that Jesus is greater than all and is preeminent despite what you think. He is. He is. I am. He just is. So Jesus' identity in relation to God, the, the creator God, is that he is a creator, and in relation to creation, visible and is visible, he is a creator, therefore all creation is subject under him. Takes us to number three in your outlines, Jesus' identity in relation to the church, verse 18 of Colossians 1. It goes on to say, he, being Christ, is also head of the body, the church. We've been talking about this for like 27 weeks at Ephesians. And he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And, you know, we've talked about other metaphors, and there are many metaphors in God's word, Revelation, that tells us about the church. What does the church mean? It's been called a flock. It's been called a bride. It's been called a building. It's been called a vineyard, a family, a kingdom, and here a body, because the church is the body, and Jesus is the head of that body. And being the head, that's where the brain is. That's where the controls are. That's where the thinking process happens. That's where the body reacts to the brain. The head gives life. The head gives direction to the body. And we saw that in Ephesians 5.23. Christ is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. He saves the body because if the head is severed from the body, the body dies. And so those people in Colossae, he's telling them, look, Christ is not some angel Christ is not some ghost or emanation. These false teachers are having to believe something that's not true about Jesus and understand who the real Jesus is. He is God. He is over all creation. And he's the head of the church, not the Pope. Not some teacher. Not Peter. Christ is the head of his church. Jesus is greater than all, and he's preeminent. And Jesus Christ is the source of the church. It says in verse 18, he is the beginning. He is the originator of it. He started it. He created it, if you will. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. 
Jesus is also the firstborn from the dead. And it kind of is the same language as verse 15. It's not talking about uh, chronological. It's similar to verse 15 when it says, firstborn of all creation, that was rank, that was position, and so it is here. He's the firstborn of the dead, meaning rank and position. Of all the people who will ever be raised from the dead, Jesus is the highest. Jesus is preeminent. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also God, the Father, highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at that name of Jesus every knee will bow. And when it says every knee, it is every knee. Even non-believers, even demons, even Satan himself, all will bow. All will bow. Those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, in case you're missing it everywhere, always, all people will bow. And every tongue will confess that he's the Lord. Not all will be saved under him, but everyone will acknowledge who he is to the glory of God the Father. So why is Paul saying this? He's just hammering the point. Jesus is not some ghost, people. Jesus is not some ethereal thing. He's not just some emanation. Verse 18b of Colossians 1, so that he himself will come to that first place in everything. And I just wrote down a list. Make your own list. Look at my own life. Look at your own life. Is he first place in all the categories of your life? In everything. He has first place in our family. Is he first on the family list? He has to have first place in your marriage. He has to have first place with your children. First place in your jobs, with your time, with your talent, with your treasure. First place in the music that you listen to when you're driving in the car. First place with the worship that we do here. First place in athletic events. If the Giants don't win, it's okay. If the Dodgers win, it's not okay, but I'm going to accept it. He has to have first place. He has to have first place with your friends, first place with your enemies, first place with your neighbors, first place, as the scripture says, in everything, everything, everywhere, all the time, without end. And your list might be different. He has to be first place with your Harley, or first place with your boat, or first place with your golf game, or your Xbox, or whatever it is. Is Christ preeminent in your life? That's a question I can't answer for you. Is he first in your life or others? What would they say about you? Because we might be a little blind to it. Oh yeah, Jesus is first in my life. Ask somebody that really knows you. Do I display in my life that Christ is the top? Does he have the top spot? Does the God, the Father, place the Son at the point of ultimate preeminence, but is he preeminent to you in every area of your life? Isaiah 52, verse 13, God the Father says, Behold, my servant, that's Christ, will prosper. He will be on high. He will be lifted up and greatly exalted. God the Father saying about, about his servant, his son, Christ. Jesus Christ is greater than all and preeminent. And Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27, All things have been handed to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone who the Son wills to reveal him. So if you know God this morning, it's because the Son of God revealed that to you. And he uses the Spirit and the Word to do it. So he must reign supreme all of your life, in all areas of your life, in the visible parts of the universe, in the invisible parts of the forces of the universe, and in the church. And the thing is, what about in you personally? Is Jesus Christ that you follow, the one that I'm reading about here, is he the one that you're a disciple of? Is he the one that you love with the incorruptible love? The great I am is he. So number one was Jesus' identity in relation to the creator. He is the creator. Jesus Christ's identity in relation to creation, it's all subject under him. And Jesus' identity in relation to the church, he's the head of the church. And number four, and the final point, is Jesus' identity is the Christ. Verse 19 
Colossians 1.19 says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Paul sums up his argument for Jesus' true identity with this verse. All the fullness of God's Godhead dwells in Christ. And you might say, you're just repeating the first one. No, it's the fullness of the deity of the Godhood dwells in him in a man that walked on this earth. There's no one greater, there's nothing greater. He's the one, he is the only one. And if you look to another way for salvation, you're not gonna find salvation. There aren't many roads that lead to heaven. If you don't find the only path, the narrow path, the narrow gate, Christ alone, then you're lost. And it matters that he is God. It matters that he's a creator. It matters that he's the son of man at the same time. He is the father's anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He's 100% man and 100% God. He's the Christ. And you might say, John, that's 200%. That's not possible. How can a person be 200% of something that's not possible? And I would just say to you that I say this, if Jesus Christ is not 200%, then we're all dead in our sins. If he's not 200%, you're stuck in your trespasses, and you're just waiting for God's judgment with no hope, and what's impossible with man is not impossible with God, because he's God. Thankfully, he is God. You see, if both are not true about Jesus, then he can't save anyone. If what those people in the Greek philosophy and what those people that were Judaizers were trying to pin on Jesus is true, he can't save anyone. If Christ is the one that Bill Johnson says at Bethel, he can't save you. This is the dilemma. The fall happened, and sin came into mankind. And when that sin came into mankind, there was a great chasm, a holy God and sinful people. And no holy God can accept a sinful person in his presence. Therefore, he has a God-man to bridge the chasm. The only way for someone to be a sacrifice for people is if they're sinless. And no human being can be sinless, therefore Jesus must be God. 100% God. And God can't take on sin. So no one can go to the cross. It's just God floating around in some emanation. He can't take sin to the cross because God can't take on sin. So he has to be a man to take on sin. Because of Jesus' humanity, he can take the sins to the cross. Because of Jesus' divinity, he can live a sinless life and be the perfect sacrifice on the cross. The Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Is that the Christ you love? Is that the Christ you follow? He's the only way to draw closer to a holy God. He's the only way because he is God. He is the Savior. He is the sacrifice. He is the ruler. He is the Lord. He is greater than all. And he's preeminent. You don't need angels to save you. Sorry, show, touched by an angel show. You don't need angels to save you. The false teachers say you need some angels, you need some ritualistic duties, you need some ceremonial things to do. No, you have a sinful flesh to deal with. And that's where we all stand. If we're apart from God, we have a sinful flesh to deal with. And rather to to know you are lost and you are blind and you are cold, naked, and damned in your sinfulness. And the only answer is the true Jesus Christ. The true identity that Christ has been displayed in this text. Not the one that you think. Only in Christ could a sinner such as us be made complete. It's a miracle. And people say, well, I don't have a great testimony, you know, I just kind of was a good person and I didn't do a lot of bad stuff and I got saved. No, you were a sinner damned for hell and you had no way out and he saved you. That's a miracle. Colossians 2.10 says, in him you have been made complete. He is the head over all and rule and authority over all. We need that Jesus. We need the one talked about here to give us all of his grace. John 1.16, for his fullness we have already received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Do you realize 
Christ doesn't have to take your life. He just has to stop giving it. He is supreme. He is preeminent. And this last point, I said that Jesus' identity is the Christ because that is a title. It means the Messiah. It means the anointed one. The Messiah is the promised deliverer, the prophesied one to the Jewish nation, and he must be your deliverer, and he must be my deliverer, and that Messiah must be our Savior. But if he's not one through three, he can't do it. So you have to have the correct Jesus. You have to have the correct Savior. He is the one who is greater than all. He is the one who is able to save. He is the one because he's 200%. So if you're here today and you're a Christian like me, working through this this week, you're a Christ follower, you're a disciple of Jesus, then you have to live like it. And if you don't live like it, you have to repent and turn to him and live like it. Be baptized. The first act of obedience is to be baptized after you're a believer. Remember when you take communion not to do it in an unworthy manner. Connect with him in constant prayer. Be good stewards of what he has given you. It's not, you're not an owner of anything. You're a steward. Your children, steward. Your money, steward. Your house, steward. Your own life, steward. You're not an owner. Christ is the owner. He's entrusted with you talents, time, treasures, family, money, children. He's entrusted that to you to live for him. To die to self and live for him and be in the word every day and live that spirit-filled life like a great sail being pushed by the spirit, giving the direction, giving the power. Be sanctified, be set apart from the world system. If you look just like the world, there's a problem. If we preach things that are just what the world preaches, there's a problem. You have to love what Christ loves and hate what Christ hates. And you have to stay connected with the head and you're not on your own. And you have to live for him and live in him and live for his glory alone, not yours, not mine. Jesus is greater than all and he is preeminent. And the question is, is he for you? And if he's not, you need to repent and ask him to, just like he told the church at Ephesus, to repent, remember, repent, and return to him. And if you're not a believer here today, you would say, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in Jesus. I've never really even thought about putting him in control of my life. He's not my Lord. I've tried to just do the right things in life. I've tried to be a good person, but I haven't repented of sins. I haven't done all this stuff about turning from sin to Christ I haven't submitted to him in faith. I haven't confessed with my mouth. I just want to say a word of warning to you, and I'm not uh, a fire and brimstone preacher. I'm saying I've loved to you. Jesus is greater than all. And without him, you're only waiting judgment. Without him, you're, you're going to be judged one day. And I had to add this to my notes because of watching the opening of the Olympics, but because the Olympics committee in Paris decided to make a drag queen mockery of the Last Supper and mock Jesus Christ, he will not be mocked. Turn with me really quick to Galatians chapter 6. So you can see this for yourself. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That is not a statement, will be mocked, might be mocked. He is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will reap. So I pray for those that did that. Because if they do not repent and turn, they will reap what they sow. And he will not be mocked. Verse 8, for the one who sows to his own flesh will reap, the flesh will reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap, the Spirit will reap eternal life. So I'm not one of those people that says, oh, you need to not watch it. You know, it's not the athlete's fault that did that. But understand, Christ will not be mocked. 
He is Lord of all. He is preeminent. And I just want you to think about this. It's sobering from God's word. In 1 John 5, verse 11, Jesus is being referred to. And it says, John says this, the testimony is this. God, the Father, has given us eternal life. And that eternal life is in his son, Jesus. He who has the Son, that's Jesus, has life, that's eternal life, not this life, has eternal life. And he who does not have the Son of God, that's Jesus, does not have eternal life. So it's really simple. There is one way. That's it. And he laid down his life to provide the way. And Jesus is God the creator or he couldn't do it. And he reigns over his creation, or he wouldn't be able to do it. And he's the head over the church, or he couldn't do it. And you desperately need him. He does not need you on his team. He does not need me on his team. You need him. You need a Christ. You need a Messiah, a deliverer. We all need Jesus as our Savior, not our judge. And I want to bow because I love him with an incorruptible love when I stand before him. Not bow out of reverence because I'm about to be judged in shame. We need Jesus. We need the Jesus of this passage. We need the Jesus that's greater of all, and he's preeminent. Augustine said this, he values not Christ at all, does not value Christ above all. You don't value him at all if you don't put him above all. If he's not preeminent in your life and preeminent in every category of your life, you don't really value him. You just want him to fix your problems. You want fire insurance. He's above all and preeminent. Is he to you? Is he your first love? Is he your foremost love? Is he preeminent in your life? Is he number one in every category of your life? Or for some of us, does he even get on any list at all? I'm going to reread the passage and add verse 20 on the Colossians 1, and then I'm going to pray. We've read it, we dissected it, dissected it, and I'm gonna read it again and add verse 20, and I'm gonna pray. It says, he, being Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Let's pray.